Thank you, Karan. Oh, Salaam Alaikum again. Uh, you know, like, uh, I had some very fruitful discussion with some young people. And I hope that from this lecture, many of you will be sufficiently motivated to start getting into some investigation. I want the sisters and brothers, all of you now, to begin to be a serious and get, and get seriously in the observation. You know, we were yet discussing the 60 year gap. It is one of our big mysteries. We have in this late narrative that they are Muslims. But then, after the civil war, well, we have this 60 year gap from the end of the civil war in the 60s. Right on the way, we have 60 year period. There's a gap. So now, all of you, the young Muslims, that's a big job for you. Try to solve this mystery. Were they a Muslim? Do you have some diary somewhere? Or do you come across some plantation report where someone is slave owner says they have a group of people who are Muslims who are praying together? That's what they are looking for right now. Middle in the head start. That's the Islamic middle in the head start. We want to find everything. That's a big challenge for you. Yes, please. Okay. Between, uh, between the, uh, the transatlantic slave trade and the beginning of that gap, um, are there uh, are there narratives of practicing Muslims, uh, practicing slaves in the United States? Um, between between when that sort of like flow of of maybe new Muslims who, who do have a connection with like the center of, of knowledge, like how to pray. Or how, how, how to yeah, yeah, you know, I agree. You know, I think that's the big question that most of the scholars are now raising. You know, like, do you have Muslims? Because you see, you may have individuals who call themselves Muslims, but do they have institutions to establish Islamic identity? Because you have a master, so you have a community of believers who come together. They have a jamaat, they can pray together. But see, if you have individuals who are consciously Muslims, but they are not organized, then you have a problem. Now, when the Muslims were migrating from America, from the Arab world, or any part of the Muslim world, before they began to establish institutions, you have the Federation of Islamic Association, before MSA. There were many Arab Americans who organized themselves out of New Jersey, going all the way to Kiabon, Michigan. There's a whole story about that. The Federation, they used to have a journal called the Star. This was before MSA. People don't know about it. They existed. But there were a minority of Arabs who organized themselves together with some South Asians and some people from Albania. They were the people who created the Federation of Islam Association. This was before the MSA. And El Kohli, we mentioned El Kohli's book. If you read El Kohli's book, he talks about it. Because El Kohli talks about the Arab American Muslims. El Kohli, that book. And he talks about this people. This was before MSA was founded. And the MSA was founded by these Muslim students who came here to study. And those MSA students organized themselves against this Islamic society. They, they, because the MSA people. Began to challenge. They tried to institutionalize prayer as Muslims, and some of them used to visit these assimilated Arabs. And I mentioned the story of the people in Toledo, Ohio. Remember the contradiction in Ohio? You have a large number of Arab Muslims, but because they were being attracted to American culture, Many of them on Sunday, now Friday was the day that was prayer. But they used to get together on Sunday at that Masajid or Islamic Center in Toledo, Ohio. And because of American influence, something was happening then. There's not happen any Masajid today. According to El Holi, I was not there, I just read on him as a source. El Holi said that when these young Muslim kids come to the Masajid, that Masajid, that was like, at the end of it, they did, they did not grow at the pleasure of God. You will never see them in anybody. They do the rock and roll because they were as 
assimilated Arab Muslims. But see, for that time, they were trying to pass and be accepted by Arab society. But when the NSA came, they began to challenge it. And the NSA people dragged the people away and they tried to create their own. They, have, they tried to institute the Salah. They create uh, they are immigrants. They are just visitors. They are F1 visitors. They don't care. These people are citizens. Or they are the children who are running for. They go up here. But see, they were still trying to hold on to their culture. See, holding on to your culture is one thing, but holding to your deed is not doing anything. If you hold to your culture, you try to preserve your language and your way of life. But your religion may be different from that. And this is one of the reasons why all the immigrants, and this is one issue I want to address, one of the problems with all the immigrants and the Muslims are caught in this mix. And to your research, I look forward to hear from you guys through your research investigation. You can always get to me to my brother over there. If you find anything interesting, please send me an email. They can give you the email if you don't have it already. Because you see, what has to happen is one of the major problems of all Hindus and the Muslims are not different from the other Muslims. The myth of return. The myth of return. All Hindus hope that they will come to the land of promise, make money and go back home. That's the myth of return. The myth of return is very powerful. And that affects our masses in terms of institutionalization. Because you see, the young people are being assimilated by a whole society, whether it's in England or France or America. They are being assimilated to be American citizens. But the older people still have this idea of going back home. Because they feel that they don't want to stay here. So for that reason, they are not committed to institution building, to establish institutions that will sustain the life of their children in the post. They have the idea that they're going back home. So the myth of return becomes a major obstacle to all the English immigrant groups. Because they want to go back home. So if you come here, and they are very romantic about where they come from, you live in America for 30, 40 years. You don't know much about your country back home anymore. It's very different. And your kids don't know anything. That's what they know. It's by the war. The thing that is playing in their head is Beirut, Cairo, Ramallah. That's good. That's what you think about this world. You just take or enjoy it. But for them, it's New York City. Or oh, what's in DC? Or oh, Amsterdam. That's what they know. That's what they know. They face it. Is that sentiment among immigrants common in other countries or is that just in the U.S. where you have immigrants who come that have this myth of return that they're going to go back or do we see that across other cultural and other countries? It's so, all over the world. Okay. So even in Europe when Muslims went to yeah. Europe they always thought or when Muslims went to different areas they always thought hey well let's just come back. No, you see the myth of return is very long-standing problem for human beings. You see uh, the concept was first popularized by a Pakistani scholar, Muhammad Anwar, in England. He wrote a book, Pakistanis in Britain. If you look at that book, Pakistanis in Britain, by Muhammad Anwar, if you go to Google his name, Muhammad Anwar, he wrote Pakistanis in Britain. He talks about the myth of return. The myth of return is a very interesting phenomenon. Now, because of the myth of return, the myth of return is very much linked. You see, yes, uh, see, he wrote a number of books. You see, he wrote a number of books. You know, he talks about, yeah, to what extent, you see. He wrote many books. It's among many of his books, you know. You know, like, uh, so he, he had, uh, he, he talks about the Pakistanis in Britain. You know, like, in there he argues about the myth of return. And then, you know, like, uh, that other one is asking when you go, that's a whole book. But, you know, it talks about how the Pakistanis, the myth of return, what he wrote. The myth of return was a problem. But the myth of return, if you really Google the myth of return, you will see that the Jews, 
I've been the most affected by the need of return. Because you see, the need of return, you see what I'm saying, it's in the narrative. That's a good thing about research. If you do research, you will have your sources. And, and we are educated people. Because all of you now, we are educated. You can, if you have the time and the money, you will be very knowledgeable. And you read all these books. So you can read arguments and tell other people your sources. That's what Buhari was about. Because Buhari, he read and water of the Muhammad. Because one of the reasons why Buhari was powerful, he read and water of the Muhammad. Some of you are married to from Morocco, from Mexico, he read and water. The Muhammad book and water was very much incorporated by Imam Buhari. The same thing with Muslim. Muslim did the same thing. That's the Muslim scholarship and Muslim research. You <laughs> are able to take the writings of other people and make good use of that in your research. So if you do that, you will be able to footnote what you are saying. That's the good thing about what you see, he's doing a good job of footnoting. When I give lectures, I like people to footnote what I'm saying. So that that is what Muhammad is able to do. Because if you look at one of the reasons why most Muslim scholars today, they accept Muhammad and Muslim. Why? If you look at their biography, that's why the Dawood and the others, the Nisa and others, because they came after Muhammad. But if you look at the biography of Muhammad and you look at the biography of Muslim, you will see that Imam Buhari was much older than Muslim. He was older. And Muslim died 70 years before him. So throughout the lifetime of Muslim, Buhari was still alive. So whatever narrative he has could be collated with the narrative of Buhari. Buhari was older than you. And he died after you. So whatever you know could be edited while Buhari is still alive. And why are you throw away many of those studies away as conjecture, not true. But many of the people who came after him, why was wrong? And that is one of the reasons why Muslim scholars now, when you are investigating your stories now, what you have to do is the sixth year gap that they are debating now. That's the big challenge for the young scholars. I encourage the young Muslims, go and investigate very carefully the sources and find out how we can address this issue. Very important because we try to figure out. If you look at the myth of return, let me give you four points to remember. Four points, very important for the myth of return. The people who grapple with the myth of return for the longest period are the Jews. From the time Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD by General Titus, right up to the establishment of the state of Israel, it's a long time, 1,800 years. 70 AD to 1948, you see how long ago that is. Now, what is very interesting, let me say the Jews were without the state. The Palestinians are now without the state. We try to make sure that they have a state. You go to the UN, but the Palestinians they didn't have a state since 48. Less than 80 years ago. The Jews were without a state for over 1,800 years. They have not done That's why you will see, since we call them the wandering Jew. The wandering Jew, the sister, the disciples are the wandering Jew. They have no place, no place. You see, now, if you talk about the place of return, what you have to do, if you just go for right now, the of return, what you are going to find out, the myth of return, you will see how the Jews tried for centuries, tried to find a home for themselves. They are no country. It was only the birth of the generation. In the 1920s, that period of open. That time, the Turks lost control of the Arab lands. And the English took over, the English and the French took over the Arab lands. The French took over Lebanon and Syria. The British took over Iraq. The British
Greece had some problems. In Egypt, they are in condominium. When they were in Egypt, and that the condominium, you know the idea of the condominium. Now the concept makes sense to most of us now. Now you see, what is very critical here, if you talk about the death of return, what is very clear for you is that the myth of return affected the Jews. For thousand plus years they had no country return. Now what is very interesting is among the Jews, while they were living in Europe, without the country of their own, and of course many of them were living in different lands. They are Syrians, they are Lebanese, they are they are Muslim. Many of them are still in Morocco, they are still in Morocco. Now, what is very interesting here is the fact that the myth of return for the Jews was addressed by the Jews to their own way of talking to each other. So whenever they talk among themselves, and they anticipated going back home. They say, next year in Jerusalem. It never happened. Until you had the Balfour Declaration, and then when the British, they had the Jewish president in Israel today. So the myth of Israel is very powerful for groups. All groups have that. Because wherever you have diaspora, whether they are Irish, 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 for the Queen of England, for the first time we went to Ireland, and Obama went there, they were there. They had never visited the English. The Queen had been on the throne for 59 years. They never went to Ireland. Because they don't like the Irish. And the Irish don't like the England. So the problem is this. The Irish who came to America had the need of return. They too wanted to go back to Ireland. They come to America, make money and go back home. All the immigrants have that. When you have a diaspora, the concept of diaspora, that's why the diaspora concept was created. It's a Greek word, meaning you are scattered. Scattered, diaspora, scattered, and spread out. That's a Greek word. It was used for the Jews. The Greeks used the term. But they were the other Jews were kicked out of Jerusalem by the Romans. They were now in the diaspora. They fled. And when they were away from Jerusalem, they developed this myth of return. All good for them. You are in Israel. You have this myth that you went back to where you came from. The myth of return. And all the, now in America today, you have so many diasporas. You have many West Indian diaspora, Chinese diaspora. Japanese, all the different groups who are living in an other country other than their sort of origin. That's why you have all these diasporas, Chinese diaspora, Indian diaspora, African diaspora, you name it, all the different groups. They all have their diaspora. If you just go to Google and diaspora around the world, you will have many stories. And all the different groups will have their myth of which one. You follow what I'm saying? Now, why the need of return is very critical for the American Muslims is that it creates problems for the Jews. That's why, as over the last 25 years, as I go around the country, as a young scholar coming out of graduate school and going around the country talking to Muslims, I always remind the Muslims about the need of return. Now, I think we are beginning to go over that. 9 11, in many ways, solved our problem of need of return. But before 9-11, one of the major problems for the Muslims was the myth of return. Because many of these Muslims have the idea that they're going back home. That they're going back home. And this created a lot of confusion for the young kids, the young Muslim kids. Because the kids, they're American. They grow up as American kids. And I always remind the parents, if you still have the myth of return, and you want to know whether the myth is real or not, Listen to the accent of your kids. <laughs> then you know you're not going anywhere. <laughs> if you listen to the accent of your children, you're not going anywhere. Because your kids are American. They speak like American. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> and you see, one thing that 9 11 did was 9 11 provided a little reason why the middle of the is there. It is good for the children. Even 
to a decade in Israel, most Jews don't live in Israel. They live in America and elsewhere. You see, Israel has been out of for about 50 years now. They didn't go to Israel, they still stay. They didn't go back home. So the myth of return is just attractive to some people who may be romantic, romantically involved with the idea that they would like to go back to the country of Arab. But the myth of return for the Muslims was challenged by 9-11. One of the unintended consequences of 9-11 was it exploded the myth of return. Because many Muslims were now forced to be or not to be. There were some Muslims who popped up here and they went back to the Muslim countries. Only to discover that their kids are not Pakistanis or Arabs or whatever they thought they were Afghans or Somalis or whatever they thought they were. When they go back home, they discover that their kids are not accepted as people from them. No, no, they are Americans. They speak like Americans. No one they want they have to go back home. The myth of return is always there, that it's always going to be there. Because it happens to not only Muslims, it happens to all Muslims. You are Japanese, you go back to Japan. You are American, Japanese, you are not Japanese. You go to Japan, you discover that you are not a Japanese. You may look like them, but you are not one of them. So I mean, like, the, 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 that's the myth of return. It's always going to be there. This is where language and culture always intervene. And it creates a problem for the myth of return. Because when a group is affected by the myth of return, it has this illusion of going back. And this is one of the reasons why the myth of return creates a problem for many of the Muslims. Because what happens, and this is why you have a problem with the Muslim youth and their leadership. Because the youth, they have been affected by assimilation, by the Jewish culture. So many of them are not very comfortable with the master. Because when these people speak, Sometimes the elders want to speak the language of the homeland. And the kids can relate to that. They want you to talk to that in English. That's what they know. So you speak in Urdu or Arabic, they don't understand what you You see, so that becomes a problem for the need of the non reverse society. That they have defined differences, reactions from the young people. Because the forces of assimilation on the one hand, and the forces of isolationism on the other play simultaneously in the community. And you are Muslims at different levels of assimilation, different levels of self-consciousness, to the point of being assimilated becomes very critical. That's one of the reasons why over the years I tried to point out to Muslims that my study of the Muslim community in America gave me to divide the Muslims into three major categories. You have those I call grasshopper Muslims. You know the grasshopper? The grasshopper is green. The grasshopper Muslim cannot separate himself from the green grass. It's too green and can melt in the green grass. So they are very assimilated Muslims. They want to be assimilated and accepted. Very well as part of the whole society. So the grasshopper Muslim can be characterized as follows. Well. The grasshopper Muslims is so concerned about being accepted by the whole society. Your name is Suleiman. You said you take pride in your name Suleiman. Say, call me Solomon. Or your name is Muhammad, call me Mike. You see a Muslim kid working in a gas station. You used to see this boy in the mansion. And he's working in a gas station. And he put Mike on this. Then he calls him Muhammad, he put my <coughs> And his name is Abu Bakr, he said, call me Bob. His name is Uthman, call me Bos. Or his name is Fatima, call me Fax. Now you see, you have problems. This happened. Many, El Khori, when he was looking at the Arab Americans, he found out that this was happening, El Khori, in his book, which he wrote many years ago, in the 50s and 60s. He found that assimilation was forcing many of these Arab Americans to pass, to be accepted. So naturally, people who are beginning to accept certain things call me Jack. You know. They begin to they have with the 
used to by the way and so on other American groups might not be accepted if you try to nominate Ali or me are you see so this happens with the groups that you see the groups want to be accepted by the dominant society so you try to make sure that the society gives you names so you can pass under those names now, the myth of return can create a problem. In the myth of return, people try to run away from that kind of situation. So they may have the idea that you don't stay here, you don't make a but you just make your money and go back home. So you can see the touch that is created by this new interaction. On the one hand, you are being committed by the myth of return that you want to go back. But your kids are being assimilated in the society. So you have that tension between assimilation <coughs> and cultural adjustment to the first society. It's not an easy job. And it's not a Muslim problem. It's a human problem that face all the people. They have to be Polish Americans, Italian Americans, Irish Americans, and all the other groups. They, they all face the same problem. Because it's just the way groups adjust to reality. Now, that's the way you face the Catholics as a community. Whether they are Irish, Polish, whatever, you face the Catholics. If you read all the books on Catholic system and American society and culture, you can go and read those books. As Muslims, I will strongly urge you to do that. If you go to the used bookstore, look for all the books on Catholics and American society, you will see the parallel between the problems of the Muslims and the Catholics. You will read the books on the Jews and American society, Jews and modernism, Judaism and modernity. You will see, they have the same problem you are. Because they are all negotiating for identity, security, and acceptance. All of them are dealing with them. So if you look at the Muslim situation, you can see how the Muslim adjustment of American society was very much helped by the institution building. The establishment of the MSA was very important for Muslims. Because if you go to campus, you are not alone. You have other Muslims who are with you. You can have Jewish prayer together, you can have Islam prayer together. That's why across the country, you go to most of the campuses, there is a special place where the Muslims are performing five days. All over the country. Wherever you go to Georgia, any of them, the Muslims have prayers. I've been to many of these places where Muslim Muslims, they do fire prayer, the prayer, and all of them. So this is one way they can teach themselves. And that's part of your identity building. The other thing is the Muslims who create their own press. They have their own publication. So they begin to educate other people on how Muslims are thinking. That's part of your institution building exercise. You begin to address the question of the need of the law, the question of cultural adjustment, and the association of the Muslims and others in the world society. So the, to the MSA, the Muslims gradually begin to establish themselves. And as the Muslims begin to have centers like Adam and all the other MCC and all kinds of Muslims around the country, now we have thousands plus, at least 3,000, besides the big ones like this one, around the country. And now the responsibility for the young Muslims to write their stories. If you can get, if you can do that with your friends around the net, you begin to write the stories of the various societies. There's one thing that he had done, he tried to do very well. Amir Muhammad and Farid Numan have been traveling around the country taking pictures of various societies in all sides around the country. Now, that's a good development for the Muslims because you begin to know where you are located. With GPS now, if you are driving, you know where your net margin is. Everywhere in the country. So this way, you are now beginning to find where all your societies are. And as Muslims, you now begin to find yourself very well established in society. So as you grapple with the middle of the town, the color of your demands, one of the problems we have, and I think there's one thing I don't think that address is very well, MCC. And many of the Muslims over the years, I think the leadership, I tried to bring 
their attention to solve these issues. And many of the societies are addressing this issue. And I know that now the Imam and I know are very much aware of us now around the country. Because these are issues they have to talk about. Especially when you deal with the problem of the younger Muslims. Because what is happening is how are the Muslims able to negotiate their way in the life of society in America? How are they negotiating their way? Both the Muslim boys and the girls, they are on college promises. They have to access and project themselves as Muslims. And then as they go around the country, if you go around the country as a Muslim scholar talking to Muslim communities on campuses and communities, you try to see how the Muslim young people are negotiating their identity in the United States. Not only are they dealing with the need of reform, but they have to deal with the important Imam Syndrome. Have you heard of this? The important Imam Syndrome. The important Imam Syndrome is that you see, in many of the societies, they are having a tradition to get an Imam who is imported directly from Yemen. And he or she comes to their own Michigan or somewhere else. And he is not very well exposed to American culture. He may not be very fluent in the English language and American society. But he may be very knowledgeable. He knows what he is talking about. The parents of his kids, they like that. Because he can give them ego massage. And he can give them cultural treatment from their country of origin. But their kids don't think that. This is what we call the important Imam syndrome. It's not a Muslim problem. It happened with the Jews. They had the same problem. The imported Rabbi syndrome. It happened with the Catholics. The imported Catholic priest syndrome. You find some Catholic priests who were brought into a community from, from, from Rome by the Pope. Lo and behold, the people don't like that person. They have to be the German Americans in Philadelphia. That was why the German wrote the book, asking him that we want a German-speaking priest, not an Irish, because the Irish are the majority of the priests among the Catholics. You see, the Muslim now, on the other hand, the children of the Muslim immigrants is the fact that we may have a Muslim who come from the whole country, and that person is going to be speaking in the Messiah. So the, this is a problem. Because you see, the important demand may be accepted by the elders and the older people, but the young people, they don't feel very comfortable in their presence. And this is what is called the important demand syndrome. And of course, this problem doesn't exist among the African Americans because their imams are basically African Americans by themselves. The only criticism that some the young people should say that the imams don't know Arabic that the imams are not the trade. That may be criticism of the African Americans who, when you study in Syria, they know Arabic from Syria, they study from some of the madrasas there. Or they went to Egypt and they come back. And, or they went to Morocco and study at first, so they come back. So, they speak when they come back to their master on the imam of Muhammad, they think that they know Arabic. Whereas the Imam don't know Arabic, so for the reason you have a problem developing within the followers of Imam Wa Muhammad. So when you look at this phenomenon, what you have to recognize is the fact that the Muslims have to grapple with the myth of return and they have to grapple with the phenomenon of the important Imam. Now related to this issues of the of return, the important demand is the problem of Muslim education. Are you educating the kids at home, home education, that means you can teach their kids at home, or are they sent to Sunday school, or are they going to an established, established school? You found that These are the three ways. You go to public school, you go to an established school. You go to Sunday school to get your Sunday education, where you do this arm, you learn it for sets of verses of the Quran that you teach you. And this way, you are a kid who has Sunday school. 
but Muslims don't like the arts. You know, if you're familiar with psychology or the sociology of words in the Muslim world, in South Asia, in Asia, in Africa, and in the Arab world, owl is not a very popular bird. You know the owl, what do we have? It's not a very popular bird in Africa, in the Middle East, or in Asia. You don't like the owl. But if you are Muslim, you live in the West. You have to like the owl. Because if you are a Westerner, the owl is a good bird. It's the bird of wisdom. It has people. <laughs> That is this dog, the owl. Why? Because it's working between these people here, who are too secular, that they don't, they, they even lose their Islam confidence. But these people are very proud, they want to protect Islam. To the point that they cut off from the dunya. This is what I'm saying. So, now, if you are the owl, you become the bird of wisdom, hopefully. But I was reminded by one of your leaders here in your party, when I was giving a lecture, why can we call ourselves the Muslim Hebrews? <laughs> because the evil is a part of American society. And the way you can change the metaphor for the evil is the Muslims are going to like the evil more than the owls. <laughs> but you see, the, 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 the problem I'm saying here is that you see, if you look at yourself, you have to find a metaphor. And I hope that some of you may come with new metaphors. All of you, you can think, you can find metaphors. You are like, you are thinkers, you are educators. So you can find new metaphors. And find new metaphors that can describe these different kinds of Muslims. The reason why I went there, I think it's geological. I've written somewhere, if you check what I wrote, you will come across somewhere where I am, that I deliberately used to experiment. Because I wanted to make sure that we don't step on the psychological toes of what I'm saying. The moment you give terms, and you call them moderate, radical, etc. You divide it. But if you use the zoological metaphor, people will have fun with it. Am I a grasshopper? Am I an owl? Oh, I'm a nice. They can enjoy that. What do you call their moderate Muslims? Their radical Muslims? They're extremists. No, that's not good. I don't go with that. I tell these people to take them to what they want to do. You see, but I hope the metaphor will help them. Because, you see, Allah is very good with metaphors. And if you look at the way Allah talks in the Quran, he uses metaphors very well, very clearly in the Quran, metaphors. And metaphors are very powerful. Because metaphors, they help you understand the text, the message that is being communicated to you. So I found out the zoological metaphor is to help help the green grass and the grasshopper. The oyster and the world, proper oyster, any world, this family. And then you have the owls. And you know the owls like to be at night. <laughs> they feel like they can. The daycare is too lazy. You see. Now, and if you are Muslim, you can see some significance in the owl metaphor. Why? The owl metaphor, as I was thinking about it, I was very much driven by the Quran itself. If you look at the Quran, Allah Himself is swear by the Khabar, the moon. He swear by the sun, suns. Right? And what do you know? The sun is very powerful during the day. Metaphorically, if the sun is the dunya. And you say you want to know God. Lo and behold, if you look at the sky, you want to use your eyes. And you will be blinded by the moon. You use your eyes, and you are right in the middle of the dunya where everybody is violent. Acting to be all the kind of delay. Now, if you are out, you are right. You can go out at night. Now, here, if you use the metaphor of the Kaaba, if you use the metaphor of the moon, at night, the hour is very free. So the hour wants to go higher. You can fall in love with the moon all night long. The moon is the perfect one. You don't lose your eye. So, naturally, if you speak metaphorically, that if you are in the dunya world 
Muslim Because those Arab Muslims who were operating here in the 50s, before the founding of the MSA, they had the magazine called the Muslim Star. It was produced by Arab American Muslims who have the Federation of Islamic Association. This was before Islam was They had MSA and they existed and they have their own Islamic star that was their own. You may find that in the archives. If you go to Dubai and the university is there, you may find or go to Library of Congress, you find the Islamic star. It was the publication of the Islamic Federation. Federation of Islamic Association. These were the beginnings of the Islamic press in the United States. Today you have a Muslim observer that comes out of Michigan. Some of you, some of you may be familiar with that. The mineral coming out of California. The Islamic Society of Southern California. You know the Hatun brothers? You know the Hatun brothers? They are used to America. Hatun, Hatun brothers. You know like, uh, they have the mineral is that the one of our Muslim doctors, Dr. Nakhada and his people, they published the Muslim Observer. So you find across the country a number of Islamic publications. Of course, they are the kind of community they are the Muslim journal. Long time ago, when Malcolm X was alive, they call it Muhammad Speaks. Muhammad Speaks. This was 40 years ago. Then he went for transition. That is called the Muslim Dawn. It comes out every week. It's a source of information. If you are a researcher and you want to write about the African Muslim, if you get that every week, at the end of the year, you have about 52 copies. You can write a lot of stories about the start in the African experience. All your photos, you have many photos. And get from there, or you just go to the internet. Now, even the back teachings of these publications are available. I've been warning the young Muslims who have high tech knowledge go to the back issues, scan them, and put them in the internet so that people who write about our stories they have sources. You don't have to be in America, maybe in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in Malaysia, and you can write about the Muslim stories because you have access to these publications. And you can write, you can have a lot of stories, we're educated. Now somebody in Australia, I know one fellow in Australia, he's white American, Australia, who has been following the story of the Muslims here. And he has written a number of books about Muslims in the world. But he got his books written by giving all these Muslim magazines. So there is an Islamic press in America. So the Islamic press needs to be carefully looked at. The Islamic Horizon, of course, is one of our main And if you subscribe to it, you know a great deal about what is happening in the Muslim community to the Islamic Horizon. The CIs have their own publications too. They produce their own magazines and their journals coming out. And then even some the smaller groups like the Ismailis, they have their own publications. So if they are a scholar, and you are seriously interested in writing about the Muslim experience in America. You pay close attention to the Islamic press in America. And aware of one Muslim girl who is writing her dissertation, I get a letter from her sometime back. I hope she finished her dissertation called thesis. She says she was writing about the Islamic press in America. And good luck to her. If you see the incorporation of other Muslims around the country, we will have a good documentation of the Islamic press in the United States. And in, from a comparative point of view, whoever is doing such a research who benefit from the writings of others who publish under the rubric of ethnic press in America. Just Google ethnic press in America. You would be surprised if you Google ethnic press in America number of presses that are put out by the various ethnic groups in the United States. They have their own publications. So, 
So you know that you have this reality that you have. So you can have to do Islamic press and its impact in American society. Then you have Imam Wali Muhammad and his legacy in Islamic experience in the United States. So if you accompany Islamic press in America, you start to benefit immeasurably from this development because you can see a great deal of things to be learned about the Islamic press in the United States of America. Now, one thing that is encouraging me, as I go around the country, I always tell the young Muslims, please, 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 you can help us a great deal as a community. If you are in your college, try to write some articles in your magazine or a newspaper. So this way you leave the Islamic fingerprints on the pages of the magazine. Because you wouldn't write it sooner or later. But if you don't write, you will not know that you were there. But if you are young Muslim, you write, you leave your fingerprints in the textbooks or the papers of those newspapers. So around the country, if the young Muslim begin to do that, you will be very well represented around the country. And that's what I will tell someone, tell your friends. If you are in college, you may be doing physics and other things, you may have time to realize it. But if there are some of your friends who are interested in writing, in Korea, so that they believe the collective development of the Muslims in those processes, publications. Now, five points to remember with regard to the Islamic press in America. The Islamic press in America has an origin going back to Alexander, Muhammad Alexander Roosevelt, you remember him? He started the first newspaper in this country, first in Malaysia. Well, he's the first person to publish. He started the Islamic press in this country. Well, we just saw him, right? When started the Islamic press? Today the Islamic press is very much alive. We have a large number of Muslims, mainly American, white white Muslims. They have Tom, the American Muslim. If you just go to Google and put the American Muslim, it's an online magazine. You can read a lot of articles there. Tom, the American, you will see it very well. You see Tom, right? You see? Just go and look for it. You can read some articles. You will see a lot of things when you have Tom. This is part of it. And there are many young Muslims now who are beginning to have online. Another thing that is very interesting for me as a researcher, and when I have time, you know, I try to get my graduate students to help to do the work. And I get people like you, you find some people, you send them to me, you have my email. Don't hesitate, please. If you come up with anything, just send it to Yang, 1911, and AOL like that. You see, like this, I get your findings of your research. You see, what is happening? You see, he's not showing you. You are not. That's your idea. Tell anybody what you can do. If you can go to town, go play with all this animal and everything. They are highly educated. Sina Musaji and others. If you go, you will know what Muslims are writing. Every day, you will be well informed. You will ask you questions. And then you will be able to know what other Muslims are thinking about. You have all kinds of ideas. That are coming out of that. So this is one thing that the Muslims have to wake up. Today you are educated, so you cannot say I'm ignorant, not ignorant. You just have to find time and you will know a lot of these things. So there is an Islamic press in America. And the Shiites, the Sunnis and other groups, the Islamic press is not only confined to spiritual and Islamic passions. There are so many groups that have specialized magazines or newsletters for their messiahs. You can write a whole paper on the Islamic press through the eyes of the Islamic journals of the Muslim messiahs. Because most messiahs now have a website and they publish their newsletter. So if you are very really interested in documenting our experiences, go to the internet and identify the material. You have 3,000 messages in the country, not all of them are website. But you will be very much better for it. You will know the Muslims in Long Island who 
Muslims in Connecticut, Muslims in Phoenix, Arizona, Muslims in Utah. You know their stories. You have to reach out to it. So there is both the electronic and the hard copy press of the Muslims. Now, it's a very rich community, right? And so we can be very well informed as a community when we meet them. Now you can see also that online we have care. Care is coming out almost daily, giving you that information. You can write the whole book if you want, based on the information you get from care. If you are a serious scholar, just from the care, you can write the whole papers. They write their whole studies. You have people like one of our colleagues, Muhammad Nima, who was the researcher at here, yeah, and now he was in the Rana University. He wrote the whole book about the Muslim Rana experience. Nima, and then look at all the young Muslims, Muftad Al-Khan, and many others. They like it. So, young Muslims now, whether they are writing their master's thesis or their paper dissertation, or they are writing articles in journals, or in newspapers, some of you can go to the Bell and Howell Index. Bell and Howell Index. is specialized in educating their readers around the world. Through the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, Social Science Monitor, Atlanta Constitution, Washington Post. There are five to six major American publications. If you go to the Bell and Howell Index, you will find that. Now you see, the good thing about research now is that if we are very serious as a community, you will begin to have a number of your people, you see, in terms of how we are fully demons out there, you know, like. They all are senior Muslims and they are very much interested in investigating what is going on. Now what is very important now is that if the Muslims are generally interested in looking at their stories, you can see the Islamic press is very much alive today through the internet and through hard copies of existing magazines. So when I talk about the Islamic press, it prepares the ground for me to look at Imam Ibn Muhammad and his legacy in the Islamic experience in the United States of America. I give you ten points to remember about Imam Ibn Muhammad. Ten points that you can remember from Imam Ibn Muhammad. Number one, Imam Ibn Muhammad. eldest son of the late Elijah Muhammad, who was proved to be the successor of Elijah Muhammad. And during his tenure as the leader of the nation of Islam, he was engaged in a number of tasks to make sure that the legacies of his father was remembered positively by Muslims, because as I said to you, the nation of Islam was not recognized as a legitimate Islamic group by most Muslims because their teachings were considered incompatible with the Islamic Orthodox teachings from the Shia as well as the Sunni point of view. Imam Warid Muhammad made a big contribution to getting the record straight for his father. He was able to bring his father's followers back to the so he led to the Americanization, that's the second contribution. Not only did he restore his father's movement back to the Sirat of the part of Sunni Islam, but he was able to Americanize the follow of his father. Because before his father passed away, his father wrote a book called The Fall of America. It was one of the books. It may be on the internet. But that's a book that's not widely used now, not widely appreciated, even by many of the people from the nation of Islam. But that was one of the books of Elijah Muhammad, the fall of America. Now, when Imam Wali Muhammad came,
again, he was able to do a number of things. And there are many of us who have identified his contribution and what he has done. The third thing that you have to give credit to the Imam was the institution building exercise of the Imam to strengthen the ideas he was putting forth among his followers to strengthen Islam. The institution building. Not only did he they corrected the teaching of his father, but he was able to make his followers more consciously American. Because his father was telling them, you are not American. We are the devils. We don't want to be ruled by the devil. But the white people are devils. That was the whole teaching of the face of Islam. So when he came, he changed the teaching of the movement by saying, we are American. If you have a Muslim journal, if you have never seen one, by one, you will see how he tried to educate the followers that we are married and we are Muslims at the same time. You will see the Quran and you will see the American flag together in the mask of the Muslim young. So he corrected the team of his father with regard to whether they are Muslim or not Muslim by moving them forward towards Islam. He encouraged them to be American citizens and be proud of their American identity. And then at the same time, he changed the movement, not only in terms of their belief system, but to institution building. All of a sudden, his father's followers were beginning to pray like the Sunni Muslims. All the Shia Muslims. Because you will not have Salah institutionalized. In the past, they were like Christians. They see, in the church, in their place like, like Christian in their church. Now, he changed, instead of sitting in the pew, as the Christian would say, they now have to go to the master, they go to the master. That's part of the institution. Really. So when they go there, like we do here in Adam and in thousands of places around the country here and around the world as Muslims, we have the sisters on one side and the brothers on the other side and we have the tradition that goes back to the time of the Prophet. So when you look at the legacies of Imam Wadi Muhammad, he introduced institution building among the African Americans who now follow his leadership. So they need to have institution very much in the tradition of the Prophet so and so and Sahabas and subsequent ulamas of Islam. The fourth thing that Imam Ali Muhammad did for his people was that he built bridges into the African American community to reaffirm the African Americans that we used to be very hostile to you because we used to call them the so-called Negroes. And if you read it <coughs> right or you listen to the speeches of Malcolm X, they used to make fun of the other black man. They call them so-called Negroes. Because they don't like the <coughs> people who kill the word Negro among the black men by the nation of Islam. They kill the word, the word Negro. Now you have to know the history of the African American to know the significance, this important role played by Mohammed. Because if you look at the history of the black Americans, the black Americans have always been struggling as to how they will try to put it up. During the period of slavery, you have a minority of them who were not slaves. One out of every 16 black Americans was not slave. They were called free blacks. Some of them were not slaves before slavery was instituted. They came in 1619 to 1689, 70 years. At that time, you can be white or black, you can be indentured servants. And that's why slavery eventually became only the slavery of black people in the history of America from 1619 to 1689, 70 years. White or black came to America, you are indentured servants. But after a time, many of the whites were able to break away from the indentured servants in the past. You escaped, but you are white, it's okay, you are white, who know you are? But you couldn't do that if you are black. Because if you are black, if you can escape. And you are indentured servants. You have to make a case that you are indentured servants. You understand? Now, those blacks who are indentured servants, they call them free blacks.
Those guys, they used to call themselves Africans at that time. When they call white, they destroyed the world from black. They laughed. That's why the black people will be called Negroes. They destroyed the world. Nigga, 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 nigga. So they did use the Latin word for black, Negro. Negro, you know Spanish? Negro. You see now the problem is this. When the problem comes up, and this is why you know when you come coming here, and you will see it's going to be and development in terms of the African community. You see, before the nation of Islam was founded, there was a big problem about the intellectual from black America. Who are we? What are we? Most of them were in the South. But then they gradually migrated to the North. We discussed that already. Now, Imam Wadi Muhammad was going to address this issue on the institution. His father was from Georgia. He migrated from the South to the North, as I told you. So when he went to Detroit, he was working in the unknown Jewish. Then he met the Arab and the other European immigrants who were Muslims. In the North, the very in New York, or in Washington DC, or in Chicago, or in Detroit. So at that particular time, most of the black people who were migrating from the south to the north, they had an important black leader called Booker T. Washington. It was Booker T. Washington who changed the name. The free blacks in America were called African. They called themselves free blacks. If you dispute it, all you have to do is look at the history of the African community here. Those free blacks who were living in America they were not slaves. So those people were the ones who founded the early churches of the African community. And all those churches carry their names. The African Methodist Episcopal Church, African Methodist Episcopal Zion. They were the three blacks. We call themselves them. Now, when Booker T was a slave himself, he was not going to be When Booker T became free, he even become the most powerful black leader in this country. So Booker T gave a famous speech. If you go to the internet and you look at Booker T Washington, you will see Booker T Washington. Go to Booker T Washington. That is name. Booker T Washington. Booker T Washington. He was a leader. Booker T Washington. See Booker T Washington. If you see Booker T Washington, he was not a person, but he was very powerful. Now, Booker T. Washington was from Virginia here. His claim to fame in the history of black people in this country is that Booker T. Washington is the one who gave the African Americans the term Negro. He was the one who used the word, we are Negro. There was a big debate among the African American letters. Are we Africans or are we Negroes? Some of the intellectuals are telling us we must call ourselves African American or Afro American. But Booker T at the time, because he knew that some of those three blacks were calling themselves African, and they did that church. African Methodist today, African Methodist Episcopal Church, African Methodist Episcopal Zion. Still there today, people like Richard Allen, who in Philadelphia, Established in Africa, the Methodist Hospital of Joy, they were free blacks. Some of them were from Virginia. If you look at the history of the African Americans, you find from Charleston, South Carolina, to Richmond, Virginia, to Washington, D.C., to Baltimore, Maryland, to Delaware, to New York, to Providence. All these African Americans who were free blacks, they were not slaves, who were living there. They were a minority among them, but all of them who were living as free blacks, they did not learn to of African Americans. Later on, the Europeans will try to get them out of this country to Liberia during the time of President Monroe. Before the end of slavery, they wanted them to go to Liberia. That's why they are going to go to Liberia. And the capital of that country is called Monroe here. Named after President Monroe, he was from here. Now what I want to tell you is to look at the legacy of Imam Wadi Muhammad. When Imam Wadi Muhammad came, his father, Elijah Muhammad, 
in hell in the legacy of this person. I tell you about the West Indian from Jamaica called Mabu Gali. Gali was Jamaica, was a disciple of Hussein Muhammad Ali. I told you Hussein Muhammad Ali. Now, when he came here, Gali organized the largest movement of African Americans. He was not a black man, he was a Jamaican. But he had a lot of influence in the society. He organized the largest movement of people in this country. So during his time, he was attracted as a 19 year old when he was working with the Sudanese English. To say Muhammad Ali, this was his name. Now, this man was the most powerful black man in the history of this country. The three most influential black Americans in the history of America was this Booker T. Washington. If you are an American black, you will get a good job in this country without his blessing. After him, the more recent times, it's just Jackson. You know what Jesse Jackson is called. And then today, of course, most prominently is Barack Obama. Now, Barack Obama is different from them. Barack Obama's father was from the narrative of that Obama. His father was from Kenya. This fire was a child of the Cold War. So that's why I said after the I'm going to see him as one of their heritage, their tradition. Now, what is very interesting is this. If you look at the story of Imam Wadi Muhammad, you have to understand the story he was dealing with. The Imam father came out of the South. He was part of the slave experience. So when the father came here, he was influenced partially by God. And God was influenced by him. Now, if you go to the England and you look at the speech, famous speech of Wadi, cast down your pocket where you are. He came with an understanding of the African American understanding to in such a way that segregation, some of you may not understand what segregation was. That made it very strange to many Muslims and many Americans today, even the young black today. You know, we are African Americans, they don't know what I tell my kids all the time, you don't know. <laughs> they are walking from here, but they don't know. They don't understand that. Like what the black white government do in this country. So the, the big problem is this. When they had segregation here, it was like South Africa before Mandela came out with you. And in America here at that time, if you go to the gas station, if you're not white, you could not go to the bathroom. They may have the Bible called Father's Holy. There may sound very strange to us today. It's very new. That very strange to many Americans. They really know that. It's a strange concept. It's not real today. But it was real. I know that. It was real. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is that when Imam Wadi Muhammad inherited the legacy of his father, he wanted to appreciate his contribution to the Islamization of the African Americans and to the Americanization of America. At the same time, you have to give credit for how you were able to navigate these people from all these storms and crises in terms of self-definition and self-appreciation. So, because of the conditions in the United States at the time of the end of slavery, and Booker T was a slave himself, and he became the leader of the African Americans, Booker T was able to make a very strong case that blacks and whites should learn to work together, even under that condition of segregation. It's going to the afternoon and cast your pocket where you are. And he moved from Hampton Institute, which is Hampton Virginia here, to Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, and became a major figure in this country. Now, part of his legacy is that Malcolm Gandhi, who is a Jamaican, was aspiring to meet him in the Hindal. Gandhi will not become a major figure, he will influence Elijah Muhammad, this movement. And then Elijah Muhammad came to Detroit to work in the automobile business. And these ideas were very coherent among the African Americans. So when you talk about the legacy of Imam Wadi 
Muhammad. You have to pay attention to the fact that he inherited a legacy, a narrative, and a tradition. So Imam Walid Muhammad was able now to tell the American Muslims there is a history behind you and you must pay attention to your history. Once upon a time, you see, they were calling, Bukhati he said, okay, we have to call ourselves Negroes. And from the time of Bukhati, until the nation of Islam became very powerful in terms of the African-American discourse on who are we and what are we. The word Negro was a used name by African-Americans. African-Americans began to call themselves Negroes. If you read their literature in the history books, they call themselves Negroes. Now, the nation of Islam began to make fun of the word Negro. If you listen to the text of Max Max, he makes fun of the so-called Negroes. He makes fun of the Negro. Now, many of the young African Americans would be agitated against that word. And gradually the word Negro became a bad word. They don't like, they don't like the N-word, of course. But Negro too became a bad word. Now, Booker T, my assumption is that Booker T knew that they couldn't call themselves African because the word African was respected to the few blacks who were so-called free blacks. And most importantly, by the time before he died, in 1915, the word African was a bad word because the Europeans were not trying to colonize Africa. And they called them savages, barbarians, and all kinds of terms to describe Africa. So it was not good news to tell the black Americans that we are African. After the word African was being destroyed. Although some of the black intellectuals earlier before the end of slavery by using the term African to make their values. The African to be sent to the church. You follow what I'm saying? So when this act was happening, now when Bukati died and the boys and others came, they accepted the term name. In their writing they also used the term name. So by the time Malcolm X came, the word Nico was being undermined. So Malcolm X and the nation of Islam bear the word Nico. If you go to Google today, you see that even the end of the CP, which used the word, they didn't want to use the word Nico. Because Booker T, who was a rival of, God, of this world, I mean, of uh, 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 words, was a rival of Booker T. He did not use the word Negro because he felt that Negro was too specific, just for black people. So if you are fighting racism, you have to use the word color. And color means the Chinese, the Japanese, all the Asians, together with the black, color. That's why they have the NWSP the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Latinos, Hawaiians, Chinese, Indians, all these other non-whites will fall on the colored people. And that's how Europeans should define non-white people, they are colored people. So that was why he created that movement. So if you go back now to Imam Wadi Muhammad legacy, you can see how Imam Wadi Muhammad became a very important figure in terms of changing the self-definition of the African He told them to call themselves Bilali. The title is the word Bilali. Bilali, this should be like Bilal. Who used that term? Imam Wayne and Muhammad. That was one of the contributions in terms of helping the African American define who they are. So he said, we are Bilali. <laughs> that term didn't survive. Forward. Because what happened is, the word Bilalia was soon to be replaced by another word. And Jesse Jackson did for the African American word because he did. We can give them the word Negro, Jesse Sun gave them African American. Now all of us are using the term African American. That's a term created by Jesse Jackson. It was Jesse Jackson who came with some intellectual from our universe, they gave him that name. So people like Ron Waters and others, they were okay. So they reminded him that this term African American is not new. Some of the intellectuals around Booker T told him to call the African American, not Negro. They should be African American or African American. But he didn't survive over 100 years until Jesse Jackson came along. Remember, Jesse Jackson is prominent in African American history. He 
that's what the president is why. Before Bill Clinton was elected in 92, he ran for the president without being elected. So he just got more than three quarters of Obama, Barack Obama. So Jesse Jackson, together with Booker T, has been the most influential African American in the history of how they define who they are and what they are. So Imam Wadi Muhammad should be remembered, not only in terms of re-addressing his father's understanding of Islam among the African Americans, but he had the Islamization and the American nation of the people. Then you move on to see the impact of the Imam. The Imam contributed a great deal to interfaith dialogue. Interfaith dialogue. He became a leader of African Americans who were now engaging the Christians, blacks, and the Jewish communities. To the point that many of the Jewish intellectuals were willing to relate with him in a way they would not have known him as well. And not with Malcolm X who was very hostile to the news. And if you read the writings of Malcolm X when you listen to his tapes, you see how he characterized the news. When Imam Wali Muhammad came, he changed that whole narrative. So he began to build solid bridges of internet dialogue. The fifth point that you have to bear in mind with regard to the jealousy of Imam Wali Muhammad is that Imam Wali Muhammad was able to strengthen the relationship between the African Americans and Muslim Ummah. How? Through institution building by creating, changing all his father's temples into Messiahs. His father used to call them temple, just like the Holy Science temple. Now he called them Messiahs. So all the temples are now Messiahs. And they operate like a Messiah. Now, Imam was also engaged in institution building. His father used to have a human university of Islam. These were schools given by his father. He renamed the school after his mother, Sister Clara Muhammad. Oh. And they were given Islamic curriculum. And if you travel around the country, and you go around the country where you have his followers, you will see the followers of Imam Wadi Muhammad very much engaged in studying Islam. They have the Quran, they speak the Hadith, and they follow the speeches of the Imam. So there are hundreds of tapes of the Imam educating them about Islam in the American context. Now, Imam Wadi Muhammad should be remembered also, not only for his interfaith dialogue and his institution building effort alone, Metamorphosis and schools, <laughs> but he also made sure that his followers were not beginning to eat halal food. They begin to have access to halal food. That you have halal meat and you have halal part of your eateries, your restaurant, and your food. Now, Imam Wali Muhammad would also need a legacy of scholarship and learning among the African Today there are hundreds of young African Americans who have gone to colleges and universities and are doing very well now thanks to the leadership of Imam Wadi Muhammad. Because there are, I know many young African Americans now. They have their PhDs, master degrees, bachelor degrees, in various fields today, some of them are just dentists and professors and lawyers. Like people, they came out of the nation of Islam, but under the leadership of Imam Wadi Muhammad since 1975. Now, the Imam should be remembered for two other reasons. The other thing that we want to remember Imam Wadi Muhammad is that Imam Wadi Muhammad was not only engaging in Americanizing and Islamizing his followers, but he had also left a legacy of Imam Sikh among the African Americans. We find that today, around the country, there are several dozens of African Americans who have been trained Islamically to articulate and develop Islam. So you now find around the country many of these Imams, 
so-called Negro, then to Malcolm X and W. Dean who used the term Biladi or African American. Was that yeah. like the chain? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, let me just be one thing. Then it's going to be great. But that, that be what I'm saying is that you see, the African American Jacobs, who were the founding fathers of the first African American Christian churches, they used the word African. That's why today, if you look at the black churches in America, you will see that the African Methodist Episcopal Church is one of the early black churches. Then the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Zion, these are the two black churches. There are black Baptists. Okay, the African Baptists, black Baptists, Baptists. Now, there are black Catholics. They are 10% of the African Americans. Most of the Americans are Protestants. The Catholics are only 10% of them. What I'm saying is that if you look at the impact of their intellectuals who affected the way they define themselves and call themselves, those blacks who call themselves African blacks, those blacks who call themselves African Methodists, they were the free blacks. Right. During the period of slavery, as I told you, before 78, those blacks were just like white, they were in ancient servants. But after 70 years, this was before the American Revolution, those blacks who were not slaves and were considered free blacks, they lived in places like Charleston, South Carolina, Richmond, Virginia, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Maryland, all the way to Providence. Moran. Those blacks were free, they were called free blacks. Slavery was still going on in Iran, but they were minority. What we now know is one out of every 16 blacks was paranoid. They were very small person, one of 16 of the blacks. Now, what is very critical here is that during that time, the world Africa was used only for those people. And when the American colonization society Try to move these three blacks back to Africa on the present Monroe. We were the present United States. President Monroe. So when they began to change their definition of self, it goes for Booker T. Booker T was a slave. When slavery ended, he was a free man himself. Remember him now. See, he was born just before slavery ended. No, 30 years later, by the time he was a grown-up man, slavery 
was still going on. But when he was 18 years old, 19 years old, he was old. So he was young. Now, what is very interesting about him is that he emerged during that period of time as an important figure in the history of the African realm. Now, when he looked at that situation, he couldn't call his people after the only events, but not that they were going to tell, even though they made their churches at that way. So, and most of those were being called by the whites, the rulers. They used to be anyone. He's not a bad word, he means a lot of black. So, what Negro would be introduced in the equation is the poor whites who destroyed the men. Because those three blacks, they were themselves out. But then the other blacks were enslaved. They could be given the word nail. But the poor white was destroyed at the time. They destroyed it. So what happened is, <coughs> when Pugati, <coughs> when Pugati emerged as the leader of the African he found out that the best way to call his people is to take the Spanish word for black, Negro. It's already known. If you are among the Latinos, they know that they were using that word. But he knew that most African Americans don't know the word Negro, meaning black. They don't want the N word, Negro either. So if you want the word Negro, you will have impact. They'll have this new word. It means black. But it doesn't have the negative connotation of nigger. And he doesn't want to use the word African, because the word African was being destroyed. Because the Europeans were now taking over Africa, were now beginning to call them barbarians, etc. So he was not in any way attracted to the term Africa. So that was why, when he gave that famous speech, you see, as the head of the blacks, in the United States, who was the most visible black at the time. He used the word Negro. He said the word African, or the Negro word. He wanted to call his people Negro. But he knows that only the Spanish and the Portuguese and the French, the word Negro being black. So he took that word. So all of a sudden, even other intellectuals who were opposed to him used the term Negro. But people like the boys prefer the word college. So when he organized some of the black intellectuals at the Niagara Falls, that area, they call them the Niagara Falls, he told us after American, okay, we are going to call ourselves colored people. Because this way he can get the Chinese, the Japanese, the Indians, and all the other new Asian people and Latinos. They always go under the non-white, they call them colors. So long as they're non-white, they have a color. So it worked for him. You see, it worked for him. So the boys push for that. So you have two terms competing among African Americans. The word color and the word negro. Yes, please. Doctor, thank you very much for giving clarity on that word and the etymology of that word uh, negro. But I'd like to ask a, a question. Uh, in the day of the Prophet Muhammad, Salaam, and the Salaf or the original pious uh, predecessors, what did they call black people? Because if you look at some of the hadith, and I can only paraphrase, yeah. when they talk about follow the Imam, no matter if he's uh, a Negro whose head is like a uh, raisin yeah. or whatever, what, what was the actual term? Did they say specifically black, or did they, or did they say uh, an Ethiopian, meaning an Abyssinian? Were they, were they actually talking about color, or were they talking about nationality? Yeah, yeah. okay. Now, it's good that you raise this issue. And then I have now, a comment. He's asking the question on the side. And I have a comment. Well, if you are in literary scholarship, the use of terms, particularly during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, okay, he's not the only one he said. If you go to the time, the question he is asking 
This is the important question that has been raised over and over again. If you go to the time of the Prophet Muhammad and the question of race or color came up, and he was told when he gave that fair speech, he made it kind of very clear. Whether you are uh, you know, you know, white, or you are also black. Now this is murder. You see, the problem is, at that time, the Ethiopians represent a particular national origin, Bilal. Now most people now, when we think about Bilal, we know he was Ethiopian, but he was black. Black in the sense that he was Ethiopian. Ethiopian, you know, they are different colors. So you couldn't just characterize them, you see, black. You see, even after red, you know, you have to work on black. You have all kinds of colors in, in the African community. You can be almost white, and you can be ebony. That's why even among intellectuals here, black Americans, they to ebony, you are very black, ebony. It's a metaphor of blackness, ebony. And then you have many African Americans, they're almost white. You see, so the problem is this. When you go back to the lifetime of the prophet, he knew that there would be life. And of course, when Muslims look back at the life, and they see him as Aswa. You know, like the reality is, when you look at the Prophet and the people of Arabia at that time, and we're still dealing with that problem today, that's why you cannot define an Arab by color, no. Not by color, no. Because you just have to go to the Arab world and you go all the way around the Arab world. You have all kinds of color in the Arab world. You see, so. If you go by nationality, that's very different. You're going by a geographic area and the people who live in that geographic area. Mm -hmm. So when you say Ethiopia, Ethiopia, today we use the word Ethiopia, that's a Greek word meaning black. But see, during the time of the people of people of Havash, Havashia, those are the Ethiopians, we call them now. They're from Havash. They came from Havash. Remember, the Ethiopians and the Yemenis, they are very close. You go to Yemen, you have so many Yemenis who are Ethiopian and Somalis. So many of them. You go to, you see, you find many of them. You see, so the problem is, it was not the problem of color the way it was characterized by many of the people in this society. You see, that's the tragedy of this narrative. So the Prophet Muhammad, when he was talking about whether you are Arabian, white, or you are Ashton, that was a metaphor. He was trying to tell them in his farewell address that on one of this, if you remember that you are all children of Adam, you go back to your ancestors, and over time you come to a point where you are being reminded, don't try to discriminate one from this body or the other. That is one of the reasons why you are told very clearly in the Quran that in the final analysis you are going to be charged on the basis of taqwa. You see, that is going to be the basis. You are going to be judged by your country. So, if you bring that understanding that you have now yes. to the American study, you have to understand the problem facing Bugatti and all the black intellectuals here. Bugatti, he knew the word Negro but he didn't want his people to be stigmatized by people use of the term. Malcolm X, he knew, Malcolm X knew that. He knew the origin of the word Negro. But Malcolm knew that the word Negro was being used negatively. He was in the same situation as the people with regard to the word African. Because they have now, among the African intellectuals, there was a desperate attempt to reconcile the word Negro which was now being associated with Uncle Tom. Number 10, Natara. Yes, sir. You have Natara who led the revolution here in this state. Natara rising. You have a black slavery boat in this state here. Excuse me, sir. Yes, sir. Before you call somebody else, I'd ask a question. Yes. But I also want to make a. Uh, Comment yeah, with all due respect to uh, Du Bois and Washington, uh, what they had to deal with in their particular day. Well, as you know, 
one of your colleagues over at Howard, um, Dr. Francis Welsing. Oh, yes, he is. She's a psychologist. Yes. She took it to another level for uh, mental health purposes. She says that we shouldn't regard ourselves as colored or non-white. Yeah, I know how any country do it. Non-white. what you say. Non-white suggests uh, white as a standard, and you look upon yourself as substandard when you when you define yourself as a non-white. So we should define ourselves. No, no, I don't think right. we should. I, 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 define I, I, ourselves I, I, as black, I, I, not. No, I, I, I'm very aware. Yeah. I'm not a defensive Chinese, or this, or that, or the other, or the other. Uh, 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 our brother, before I continue, what our brother is doing, he's giving you a guided tour to black intellectual debate as to names, self-definition. That was a big debate, what he's talking about. Francis Chris Wilson is an African-American intellectual who is very much familiar with psychology. And she is a good beneficiary for the kids. <laughs> Try to protect the little kids, so physically and mentally. Because if you're a black kid, you have to be protected so that you don't grow very well from your pediatrician. But you must also be psychologically trained so that your brain is not desperate. But then you'll be very vulnerable. No, I know what you're saying. And she made a big use of the term Semitism, Semites, a big debate. Try to use. <laughs> but what she was saying, no, you see, what happened to us most of the time is that people can use words and if they are not very careful, they get trapped. That was why when Malcolm came and he started poo-pooing the word Negro, so-called Negro, the word became so bad and the word began to be identified with Uncle Tom. You see, and this becomes a very important debate among the African intellectuals. Who are we? What are we? Where are we? And where are we going? The nation of Islam, in my view, helped destroy the term Negro. And the nation of Islam, that really comes now dialect. And the Booker T's idea of the Negro maybe was very good for him. And Du Bois, another intellectual, who was also trapped in that term when he came with the word color, as you are saying, you are trapped either way. Because you see, you are allowing somebody else to define you in a such a way that you are to not be antithetical to the dominant paradigm. People who have the power to move forward their way of thinking. And that's the dilemma we face. So the Muslims now are coming to a situation they want to destroy all these concepts to really affirm a new way of looking at ourselves. As human beings, we are Muslims, we are defined not by our color, but our belief, our religion. We are not dunyaists. That's why I tried to argue yesterday. If you are junior Eastern, you get trapped by this world and all the ideas that are related to Dunyaism. <laughs> but if you are a Muslim, you believe that this world is real. It's not fake, it's not false or illusory. But you believe in the Akhirah. So if you believe in the Akhirah, you prepare yourself for that destiny that you're going. And if Very well said. Yeah, but yeah. That's why we, no, because when you call the borderline between the living and the dead, <laughs> but the other one, all these, all these dunyaistic concepts are useless. Now, the, the, the boys, he got clarity in the end because he fought uh, Marcus Garvey on his concepts no. during his life, but before he died, he was buried in Africa. In Ghana, no, no, you're right. I agree with you. He came to See, understand. He was trapped by his intellectualism. Yeah, he came to that, understand that, that, exactly that, that, who he was. Yeah, no, he's raising a very important point. That's the idea of history. Because you see, sometimes you are intellectually trapped. And you get so trapped that you cannot see light from reality. But in the end, you are smashed by historical forces. Yes, I think this will be research. We will investigate. Thank you, Two John. sisters here, one by one. Um, what is now? I wasn't here earlier, but I don't know if you covered it. I was looking if you think if there's any places that I can go to to get more information about Native American Muslims and Oh, you Native American She's asking about the Native American Muslims. And Latino Muslims. No, no, I tell you. I just <coughs> give you a quick summary of what I have said with your friends. And then you have some of your colleagues here. But, and then you can always keep in touch by email. So, now, let me ask you. Then the other sister there, after this you have another one. 
Let me add a few more things. I think she's also asking about references. Like references in Oscar Latino Muslims. For Latino Muslims as well. Yeah, oh, Latino, okay, that's good. No, you are really quite a part of the Muslim story now. And you're getting a legend. That's why people have time. I can do references later. This is a problem later. No, 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 no. Okay, I'm done. I want you to investigate, and if you find anything, now let's see it. You're trying to institutionalize this. You're working with your brothers and sisters here. Any information you get, any other question you're raising, if you have any, some suggestions, I told you, if you have anything, send the email. Let's hear what you're doing. Because nothing I can get. Now you see, I know that in Native America, I didn't say that in Native America, I thought just came to my mind right now. There is one African American brother. Khalid Drake, maybe you never heard of him. Khalid Drake, he is in North Carolina. And he was the editor of Message International. You know Message? It's the publication of the Islamic Charter of North America. They have a whole issue. If you write to them, they send you a back issue where they have a whole story. Where many of the Native American Muslims try to describe their encounter with Islam. It's a whole issue of Message. Magazine. If you don't get any, please send me email. I'll contact them, give you your address, and send you. You can send your copy. Because what they did, they didn't have some that <coughs> Because I didn't break. What he did was, and actually, they didn't have his album. Because now young, young uh, members of England, you know, like, I'm sure they have. Maybe they have an electronic copy of it already out there. You know, they need to have it. Yeah, they answer. See, that's a... You follow it? I follow you. What is that? Are you familiar with this? An answer is like a... You don't know what you're doing. Oh, an answer is like a... It's one of the... Latino Muslim groups. They have been very active over the years. You see, and they have been really pushing and bringing to the attention of the media Latinos the Muslim idea. So that's their magazine, they have their account. And they have, if you, you can subscribe to their website and you'll be very much, if you are Latino and you're interested in Latin affairs, you don't have to be Latino, you just Muslim, because you don't understand it's not Spanish. So you're interested in the, in the Spanish heritage and you do not find your story. So now that's what you can do. As a people uh, and then one more question. I told you, some of these Pujani Americans have Latino connections, not Canada. And I told you, about Pujani Mexican, you are not here, come on. We have the American Muslim cultures, leaders of the nation, two world. You can learn a lot from them. American immigrant cultures, builders of the nation, you will learn a lot from them. See, and this is something that should be very well known. So I'm always going to be. Nice now. Yes, uh, I, I lived in uh, Arizona for a few years, about five years, and there were two important Oh my God, he's getting done. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. And there were two important discoveries that I, I made. One was uh, visiting the grave of Hajj Ali in Portside and, and hearing stories that the dates, the much do dates that we get from the Bard Valley are all part of what he planted, or, or dates from what he planted when he came over. It sounded like uh, the United States government employed him to teach camels during the American Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm familiar with your story. Yeah. You know, like, uh, have you heard of this, you fellow he came up, I joined among the military. I they have a song, I joined. He was a Muslim who was working here in Utah, you know, at that whole area, Arizona, you know, to introduce communism. If you talk about Afghan Muslims in Australia, they were part of that narrative. Oh, now, what some of the scholars are suggesting, Haji Ali, I researched this fellow over 20 years ago, Haji Ali's story. You know, like, at that time, we have, it's like Hadith studies. You have all kinds of narratives. There were some scholars who tried to link the Haji Ali to some great Muslim. You see, we are not able to verify these claims. But we do know the problem of how he 
U.S. military. High grade story is now very much part of the challenge. And what you say in Arizona is part of the story. Circulating in that area. So what has to happen is we have to have some young Muslims to really pursue what you are saying. Tell the young ones. And some of them are going to school in that area. If they are serious about it, they will begin to investigate. And through the internet now, we can all communicate with one another. And then, and as you can see, he's asking me about the question of the Native American. And you're like, uh, the Native American story is part of your story. So you guys, the young ones, now, what I'm praying for is, I want to see many of these young Muslims now, on the college campuses, to begin to take this issue. You form your own study groups. Soon you guys will begin to put out some articles you will begin to publish on student newspapers and in publications like this. You have to make another thing. You will be very happy to maybe say your research like this. Um, what the said about as a
try to get you to come back to our meetings and visit you again. It's not um, during the, um, I think it's around 64, maybe. But before that, when the Arab Christians started coming over, they, they did the same thing. They only did it. 90% of the Arab white Christians. Yeah. Because you say that they bombed the government to get themselves behind the Caucasian. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. He's asking a very good thing. No, he, again, the question, the racial question. Now, see, when the Arab Christians came, <coughs> you can recite this. Just go to the Supreme Court of the United States. Or even if you go to Google right now, you say, Arab immigrants and the courts on the race issue, it will come up. Because there were many cases involving Arabs, whether they were white or not white. It's a big case in the Supreme Court. Because they, the same thing happened with many of the Muslims of India. The, the big, big case is the case of the United States. Because they were attempts to deny them white privileges and white classification. And so that reason, they went to the courts. They went to the court to fight for white status. And it became a big goal of my And so, in the final analysis, the Supreme Court was going to decide. And of course, remember now, the way American society was, the American society was very hostile to many groups. Many groups that now see themselves as white, they were not seen as white by the people in this country. Because, you see, that's why the Catholics are you know, involved the Italians, the Irish. And you're like, what happened was in the history of the United States, <coughs> the 93 percent of the Americans at the time of the independence were English. Remember, I told you that when you use the term British, you are bringing together a number of groups: Irish, Welsh, and Scottish in the company of the English. Now, the English, who were dominant, they created this way of discriminating other groups. If you were not a Welsh, you're familiar with the term Welsh. White Anglo-Saxon. White Anglo-Saxon Protestant, Welsh. Now, if you are not Welsh, you are not good enough. You can be white, but you are Catholic. You can be white, but you are Jewish. So you are out of it. Now you see, so that was one of the way they used to discriminate all these other groups. What worked in favor of the other white groups was the fact that you have the African American population and the Native American population. Because you see, as the whites began to fight each other as to who is American, who is white, the existence of the African American is very useful. Because remember, many of the whites were indentured servants, but they can escape. So if they escape, they are no longer indentured servants. You cannot pray for them. But the blacks could not do that. The only thing they could do was, for those blacks who were indentured servants, they were free only when they are in the area where they were known as indentured servants. If they go anywhere else, they may be apprehended as slave free. It was why it's very difficult for the African Americans to have free blacks. They couldn't go to other places where they are unknown. Because the bounty hunters, you know the term bounty hunters? The bounty, yeah, the bounty hunters will catch you, you may be a free black. And you are living in New York, don't make a mistake, and go to Mississippi. You may never go back home. You see, because they think that you are a slave, when you are not a slave. You see, so this was the problem. So when you buy, when you are Arab, you are from Syria or Lebanon, you come here. You can pass. You can pass on the white person. But see, the problem is this. The moment they know that you don't know English, they may begin to suspect you that you are not really white. Because you are not English speaking. This one said, same thing happened with Italians. If you read about the story of the Italians in the world, just go and read that book I tell you. You know the Italians. <coughs> So that was the basis of discrimination. When you talk about those Arabs who came here, 
the end of the court to put the law away. There was no DNA at that time. Today, I mean, that's a lot of federal documents. They always ask me my race. Now, yes. they say African American, because an African. They insist, in parentheses, it says, Caucasians to really North African, so I'm North African, so I have to go to Caucasian, which is not right, it doesn't make sense to me. So every Egyptian would be considered uh, Caucasian, even though know, there, there are Egyptians that are black descendants. I know, I know, I know, I know, you see, no, it's all politics, brother. It's all politics. Is that, is that why, though? Is that because of this, these Supreme Court cases? No, well, no, the thing is, when, when they went to the Supreme Court, there is something that has to be brought to the attention of now, to go back and look at that narrative, the point is raising is a very good point. Because you see, that was the problem, you know, facing many of our brothers from North Africa. Because you see, his own politics, you see the French attitude for the Maghrebians, you see, you know, come from Algeria or Morocco, and they go to France, you see. They can play this game. You see, they can play game. If they want to discriminate against you, they can come up with any kind of game. So what you are saying, Abu, oh yeah, you know like you you come in there. You see, they can try to play this game with you. You see, so the, the reality is, in the United States, the Supreme Court was called in the six. How do we deal with this problem? You see, so you have them from India, they try to discriminate the Indian by saying, if you are from Kerala State, Kerala yourself. You are different from those who are from India or not. That was in the courts, in the court cases. I read these stories. They try to make discrimination to know to separate the northerners from the southerners. And it's part of the day, then the INS debate. So if you go and look at the INS debate on race and nationalism, in America. Oh, oh, oh. So, it's a very interesting story. Then you like that was important for the people from China. You see, and Japan. You know, that you got given status. Because they were being discriminated again. This is how history is all about. But see, don't go, we have crossed that boundary now. Now, we have, now 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 Some people say the debate is still on, it's not over yet. But you see, the, the problem is this. Those groups that are very prejudiced and they are worse in their way of thinking, you can be white, you can be German Christian, and Protestant, forget it, you are not one of us. You are the, the team body people. You know that. You know that. The, the, the problem is. You have some people who have a way of defining themselves. And if they define themselves, they define themselves deliberately. See, the deep body people, they don't want to call themselves. You see, let me go over here. They see, the deep body people, they don't want to define themselves in any racial way. That's why they deliberately use the term deep body. Because this way, they will be linked to a movement in American history working for the independence of America. Remember, the Boston Tea Party. It's very important in the story of America. The Boston Tea Party. They were challenging the British. You see? So, but many of these people who are leaders are from the South. They don't want to be linked to the KKK or any of these racist groups. So, the only way they can fly very well is to say, where are the Tea Party? So we are resurrecting the history of those people who are fighting for independence. But you see, this color issue is a very tricky business. You have to try to find ways of making a case. And the Muslims have to deal with this reality in the modern society. That's our challenge. Okay, brothers. I think I answer your question, sisters. And you now have the emails. And you have a brother here. If you have any questions, I'm so they want to keep this debate going on. Very well. Another quick question about Arizona. Another thing, uh, one of my guys that I worked with was a uh, Navajo from the Navajo Nation. The Navajo, yeah, the Navajo, yes. North uh, eastern part of Arizona. <coughs> and I 
heard from him that there was uh, either a cave or some some place where there was writing that was in Arabic, but it wasn't Arabic. And I heard that it was later determined that it was actually Arabic Mandane language was written in an Arabic script. And it said something like, uh, you know, we're running out of water for making Mufu and and the elephants are dying and they have a they, they see some bird, white birds that they had not they didn't know what what kind of birds they were. Have you heard anything about that? No, 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 I'm not aware of this. I, I know that there is one fellow who wrote a book. Uh, we tried to so some of the linkages between the Native Americans and the Muslims, you see, and that is in the literature, but the academic community is not sufficiently enlightened to pass any serious commentary on this narrative. I'm still looking on. Thank you. There's a book by Dr. Gerald Dirks called Muslims in American History. He actually talks about it. He did? Okay. Yeah, his subscription. It's called Muslims in American History. Okay. And uh, his last name is Dr. Dirks, D-I-R-K-S. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can look for that book. Amana. Yeah, Amana Publications. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's quite yeah. a So the research continues. You are all together now. Please, keep on researching. If you find new things, let me know. Okay? All right. Very good. Okay. I think I think it's good, brother. Jazakallah. Jazakallah, Dr. Yang. Uh, I think all of us have benefited greatly from a very informational day. Uh, almost, uh, you know, it, it, again, just to reiterate something that Dr. Yang has, has been saying, uh, this is just the starting point of the research. This entire field is still very much in its infancy. And something that he's been trying to relate to us all day, I think, is that we're the standard bearers who will have to take on and build on this research that's been done to really get a true understanding of, uh, of our own history and our own legacy. So just take that, inshallah, as words of encouragement. He's already put a project on me for that. I have to do with something regarding that, so I may be tapping into some of you to help uh, in that effort. But uh, on behalf of we would uh, just like to thank you, and uh, of course we send a piece of blessing to one of our beloved Prophet Muhammad. We'd like to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having such scholarship uh, available to us. Uh, you know, it's not every day that we have individuals who kind of have their own Wikipedia if you come here. That's why I pointed it out <laughs> So, the, the mashallah, Dr. Yang has done an immense amount of work for the American Muslim woman, and I know for a fact. So that being said, uh, please make sure that you clean up after yourself, take take your phones home, join us in the weekly classes that we have at Adams uh, every Monday through Friday. Join us inshallah at an event that we'll have including instead uh, Faisal next week uh, and then next month with the Ansar Hayes and Imam Saraj uh, and Dr. Jonathan Brown. And please uh, continue to support us monetarily, both the Adams Center and the North Dakota Institute. Uh, which uh, again just runs the classes at Adams and uh, support us most importantly of course with your du'as uh, and your effort. So for anybody who's interested in getting involved, uh, feel free to reach out to me. We can, uh, we'll definitely make that happen inshallah. And, and again, uh, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the world, and we send peace and blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.